and this is what the big point that Brad made uh, that he's going to talk about at Freedom Fest, and that is uh, it increases productivity and it reduces costs in so many different areas. And this is an exciting development. You're listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, where you get valuable information you just can't find anywhere else. To thrive in today's trying times, you need the Financial Survival Network now more than ever. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and get your free newsletter and gift. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. And welcome. You are listening to watching the Financial Survival Network. I'm your host, Kerry Lutz. Got a real treat today. Mark Skousen, the founder of Freedom Fest, is on with us, as well as a well-known author and all-around flaming uh, libertarian much like yours truly and mark it's really great to have you back i missed freedom fest for the first time in 10 years last summer due to a prior commitment but i'm going to be there this year and uh, it looks like you know for a while interest looked like it was kind of waning but then uh, a lot of things happened and now you guys are back stronger than ever well, yeah, we had we were forced to cancel by Governor Sisolak in Las Vegas in 2020, and he gave us a notice like two weeks before. He kept promising that we'd be able to do it, and then he said, "Well, yeah, you can do it if you have no more than 50 people in any room, including the general sessions." And that was laughable. So, in essence, they shut us down. But you know, it was interesting. We still did some smaller conferences at the Ahern Hotel and so on during 2020. And then we came. After that happened, we decided, well, every other year we're going to go to a different city. We're we're going to be in Vegas every other year. And then the rest of the time we're going to be going. We were in, uh, in 2020, 2021, I guess. Uh, we were in... Uh, South Dakota, right? We went to Mount Rushmore, and we had a huge, huge turnout. Half the people had never been to to Mount Rushmore before, so it was quite popular. Uh, and and we, Kevin O'Leary, is our keynote speaker, and it was really a lot of fun. And then the next year, we were back in Vegas. We had John Cleese, the British comedian. We had oh, a big sure. crowd. Oh. It was really a lot of fun. And then uh, this last year, we were in Memphis, and uh, we had uh, Mike Rowe come, and uh, he was just fantastic. And, and it was, we always have a big name speaker. And this, uh, so this year we're back in Vegas, uh, and uh, I, I can reveal to you at some point in the program where we're going to be next year because it's raised a lot of eyebrows. Oh, uh, okay. And uh, uh, so uh, we might as well talk about that right now. So next year we're going to be in Palm Springs and uh, in California. That's our first time, perhaps our only time in California, land of the free. Uh, and uh, it, it, and uh, but uh, but Palm Springs is really an interesting story because that's where the Hollywood crowd and the Rat Pack and so forth uh, uh, went to write uh, uh, screenplays. Uh, I mean, Frank Capra uh, of uh, It's a Wonderful Life, uh, every time he said, let's go to Palm Springs and perform uh, or c- come up with a screenplay. Uh, so uh, that's that's quite famous for, uh, for it, it, in fact, I was talking to Van Simmons, the coin dealer, and he says that uh, there's more concentrated wealth in Palm Springs than in any other part of the world, which kind of surprised me. And so that's next year, and it's going to be in June. Uh, rather than July, so we're saving ourselves a little bit on the heat yeah. uh, in, in Palm Springs. But uh, So this year we're in Vegas. Um, we have as our keynote speaker, well, we have a couple of them. Uh, we have Steven Pinker from Harvard, who is uh, foremost, uh, I would call him the public intellectual number one in America, and his, his books on... Uh, uh, on violence, how violence has gradually declined. He's, he's done some really work there. And so we're looking forward to hearing what he has to say about the Enlightenment and rational thinking. And are we going to, are we headed for a new World War III, if you will? We have, I also have the rapper Ice T coming, who's been making quite a few really? little statements. Yeah. So Ice T, uh, he's, he's the longest standing actor in Law and Order. Uh, and of course, he's has tremendous uh, 
uh, experience with the, the the black community. And so it's, it's going to be interesting to hear him or maybe hear, hear him rap about what's happening in uh, in the world today. Uh, and, of course, Lisa Kennedy from Fox News is going to be back as our MC, And uh, we just confirmed uh, Matt Ridley, uh, Lord Matt Ridley, Ridley from uh, the U.K. So he's probably public intellectual number one of the U.K. who's coming and talking about innovation. We're going to have a debate, by the way. Kerry, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this big debate among libertarians primarily about whether intellectual property rights is an actual property right that should be enforced by law. We're talking about patents, trademarks, copyright, and there's a lot of uh, uh, oh yeah, avid libertarians who say, "Oh, there shouldn't be any laws on this," and you're on your own once you invent something. I think it's pretty crazy, but uh, uh, Lord Ridley has written about this in his book, "How Innovation Works." And we're going to have a debate on this topic. Well, uh, remember, uh, Steve Jobs was a big defender of intellectual property if it was Apple's. But when it came to everyone else's intellectual property, he couldn't have cared less. And Apple had the resources to fight any fight out there. So, yeah, I know that fight has been out there. And it's one of those kind of balancing things. Whereas if you have too much intellectual property rights, it will stifle innovation. But then again, we've all heard the stories about the car companies, and I don't know if it's true or not, but it sure sounds interesting, where they there's a 200 mile per hour, per hour carburetor that they've uh, bought up and they've uh, stolen intellectual property and suppressed it. So I want to see that uh, as a recovering attorney, and in fact, as America's top recovering attorney, I personally want to... Uh, want to view that uh, debate because, uh, you know, it it really is unsettled in my mind. And look, uh, the Chinese have been ignoring uh, intellectual property rights since they started their ascent. It doesn't look like it's doing them much good now, though. No. And in fact, uh, my wife has an experience. She wrote a book called uh, Matriarchs of the Messiah about the uh, uh, women in the Bible. And uh, she found on online on Amazon, four different books that had her exact, uh, it, it was her book. They just changed the title and changed the author, but it was her book. <laughs> just, I mean, are we supposed to just walk away and just let that happen? I don't know. It seemed, seemed a little bit uh, bizarre. And Amazon took them down uh, when, when we pointed that out, that uh, they had stolen uh, this intellectual property, copyright, they violate in our copyright. And we, by the way, we have the same problem with Freedom Fest. There's quite a few uh, organizations, primarily around the July 4th holiday, that call themselves Freedom Fest. And we write them a polite letter saying, listen, we have a trademark on this, and we'd prefer that you not use it. And most most of them have been quite cooperative. Uh, but it is an issue, and uh, anybody who's written a book or has a patent, if you if you spent billions of dollars developing a drug, I mean, should you have an exclusive right for a certain period of time at least before that? Uh, it sounds like a legitimate argument to me. So uh, this this will be a fun debate for sure. Hey, and I I've had the same thing happen to me on YouTube where people have ripped off my shows more than fair comment, put it with a bunch of other shows, and they wind up getting more reviews than me because. They're not restricted by YouTube, but because of my uh, prior political pronouncements, uh, I'm in the YouTube sandbox. You know, I'm throttled, and God forbid I get more than 5,000 views on a video, then they start suppressing it. Hey, but you know what? Look, uh, this fits into AI really well, because anything that you produce from AI doesn't have any copyright protection. Well, and uh, by the way, we had someone uh, uh, that we've invited to uh, Freedom Fest. So we are going to have a big session on AI. And this guy, uh, uh, Brad Castana, Castano, I think is is uh, is his name. And he's, he's from San Diego. We've invited him to speak at Freedom Fest. And he gives an incredible presentation on all the positive aspects of AI. And one of the examples he used was he, he gave... He said, now let me show you a lecture that I gave. And he just shows a little snippet from his lecture that he gave in English. 
And then he said, now let me show you what AI has done to create this lecture in Spanish. So it's his voice, it's his, and, but it's all in Spanish, and his lips now look like he's saying it in Spanish. You know, wow. when they uh, have that problem of, uh, of translation, uh, that's often a problem. The lips are moving one way and the language is another. Well, that's been ch- solved with AI. And uh, so he goes to a whole litany of all of these positive things that are coming out of AI instead of just the the negative that uh, the chat GBT will or allow students to plagiarize without uh, uh, impunity. Uh, the, these are the issues that I have as a professor, of course, because we want people to do their own original work. But Chad GBT, uh, they, uh, Tyler Cowan of Marginal Revolution, he did a Chat GBT. Uh, what is Mark Skousen's greatest contribution to <laughs> economics? And it was absolutely 100% accurate and really? beautifully written. I was really shocked because I've heard heard all these statements that they they come up with a lot of false information, and it's all it's screwed up. <laughs> In my case, it wasn't. All right. Well, hey, I am going to run it as we speak because I got to see this. Uh, I put in Peter Schiff one time, and it was fairly accurate. Uh, I put in, uh, like, top 10 gold bugs, and his name came up. So, uh, so, and I subscribed to it because, look, uh, I'm going to, like... Uh, make a little personal disclosure here. I used to have somebody writing show notes to these interviews. Cost me a good amount of money. She was definitely worth it. Really English scholar, had been to Oxford, and, you know, but she didn't really have an in-depth understanding of what it was I was about. When I put it through, uh, I use an AI note taker, which I'm doing on this show, and then I put it through chat GPT, I make a few edits because it's kind of it's kind of predisposed to superlatives and trite statements, so I cut them out. But you know, I'm able to do it in a matter of minutes. It's speeded up my workflow by about three hundred percent, and saving me money at the same time. So if you're reading these show notes, take note they were written by uh, by two AIs because I don't think one AI is enough, Mark. Yeah, but you raised the important point, and this was sort of the big point that Brad made uh, that he's going to talk about at Freedom Fest, and that is uh, it increases productivity and it reduces costs in so many different areas. And this is an exciting development. Uh, so uh, I I think we're afraid of it. We're afraid that computers and robots are going to take over the world and so forth. This is a genuine fear, I think, but... Uh, and and who wants to play? I don't know if you've played computer chess at all, but it's almost impossible to beat these guys. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. just can't beat them at all. You even at the lowest level, I have a hard time beating the computers. So it it takes away some of the fun of uh, of playing chess and, and other games. Yeah, well, they, you know that's that's technology for you. Well, here you are, Mark Skousen. It is an American economist, investment analyst, and author who has made significant contributions uh, to the field of economics, particularly in the areas of free market theory, investment strategies, and historical economic analysis. His work spans over several decades and has influenced not only academic circles, but also investment practices and public policy. Well, it's telling me things I didn't even know about you, Mark. And I didn't even know about it either. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it goes on and on. I, yeah, the one that uh, that uh, Tyler, Tyler Cowan did for me who said my gross output GO was my major contribution, and that was definitely yeah, accurate. Yeah, it's here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, it's <laughs> nice to see that kind of thing. Uh, I, I mean, I think overall this is really very exciting. The problem is, that you know it's going to get to the point on in politics where they can create characters that look just like the politician saying things that he never said. Yeah, that's think, going uh, to happen, that, and that has probably already happened. <laughs> in fact, we might have had an AI in the White House for years and not even known about it, Mark, right? Well, he's been cloned. <laughs> but why would why would you clone someone who's half asleep? <laughs> hey, if this Lovely. is... It, 
if this is AI, that it could be the biggest ad to like put the genie uh, back in the bottle that there is. Hey, so talking about economic theory, about advancements, did you ever think you would live to see a major Latin American country rightfully elect a libertarian who in 12, uh, I think in less than 90 days, uh, made an economy that was in chronic deficit for the past do- dozen years into surplus, closing down government entities left and right. And uh, this is like the greatest libertarian experiment, Mark, uh, that a country's undertaken probably in your life and mine. I think we've, uh, we have, uh, we have just now recognized uh, how significant this uh, paradigm shift is in Latin American politics and perhaps around the world. Um, so you you look back at Salvador Allende, the Marxist who won in Chile. He won with the uh, with the uh, there was a three way race, so he never had a majority support for his Marxist vision of Chile, and of course it ended very badly. Here you have a candidate who has won the majority. I think he won with 56 percent of the vote. And uh, and he's got very widespread support. I've talked to a number of Argentines. In fact, my uh, my son-in-law is Argentinian. And so he keeps me informed on what people are thinking and so forth. And so far, he has still very strong support, although in the legislature, he has very his own party is is an a, extremely small minority. And that is something he has to deal with. He has to deal with the Peronistas and the unions, which are still very strong in maintaining their conservative, let's keep it the way it is, uh, of corruption and, uh, and, and excessive government regulation and size. Do you know, from what I understand, over half the people, half the Argentinians actually get some kind of compensation from the government, either in payment, uh, one sort or another, they're working for the government, and so it, it's a tall order for Malay Javier Malay. And I, I, I wish his first name was Salvador, like uh, Allende, because he he could be the savior of Latin America and the uh, world. The jury is, you know, the jury is still out on this guy because he could be handcuffed. Uh, and uh, he could end up resigning. I mean, you just never know if he's not able to achieve the goals that he has. And it is political. I mean, it's everything is uh, as uh, you know. You you can have your own strong libertarian views. I mean, he's called himself an anarchist, uh, anarchist, and and uh, I think he named his dog Murray Rothbard or something. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, obviously, uh, he's not an anarchist because he's having to deal with real-world problems. The biggest issue there with Malay uh, is uh, the dollarization uh, that he has proposed, and he has not delivered on that yet. He, Steve Hankey of Johns Hopkins, who's the world's expert on dollarization, he's helped Ecuador dollarize and uh, other and currency boards and that sort of thing. Uh, he he says that Malay is making a big mistake postponing the dollarization. But of course, you have to have you have to have plenty of dollars to dollarize because if you <laughs> dollarize at a high exchange rate in order to cover your dollarization, uh, that could be quite a burden on the average person. Ecuador did this. They they converted. The uh, escudo at twenty five thousand escudos to the dollar. Well, I mean, I was in Ecuador recently, and they told me when this happened ten years ago that the the poor of the middle class were really slammed because they didn't have dollars. They had to turn in twenty five thousand escudos to get one dollar. The tax and so it was very tax. difficult. So for Argentina, this could be a problem. As what is the exchange rate? That you're going to do this as, and I don't know if you can do it right away or not. Hanky says yes, and and the others are saying we we need to accumulate more dollars. Hey, so talking about currencies, and I didn't have this on our list of things to talk about, but now that you raised it, we got this Bitcoin, right? Um, I was a skeptic for many years. I'm still skeptical because I know that it can be shut down should the powers that be really regarded as a major threat. And yet, uh, 
performance wise lately. I mean, it is the best performing asset uh, of 2024. Well, not only that, but I have a chart in my latest newsletter. This this chart will blow you away. Is it, uh, I can't. I don't think I can. Uh, it'd be nice to put up on the screen, but it's a chart showing the performance of various assets year by year since 2011. And that's uh, so we're looking yeah. at. Yeah, we're looking at eleven. Uh, uh, it's it's eleven years or something. Maybe since 2013. So eight out of the eleven years, guess guess what asset is outperform at the top? It's Bitcoin. Yeah, and then also the three years it underperformed, it was the worst performing. So it was just up and down like a yo-yo. But sounds still, like no overall, <laughs> it sounds it like it it's more you away. Go, it's the new inflation edge. Uh, it's just <laughs> remarkable. It's in, in its performance, and and all of us kind of missed it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I had the opportunity. I followed it, and I'm an expert at figuring out when Bitcoin peaks, but I'm really bad at figuring out when it to uh, when it bottoms and buying. But so what I've done is all I did was just uh, set up automatically on a site. I buy X amount of Bitcoin every Monday, and then when I believe it's peaked, I dump it, and then I begin the acquisition again. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, I don't, you know, Hey, I'm no investment guru like you, but it's proven to be an effective way to play this thing because it's much easier to pick a peak than it is to pick a bottom, at least in my experience in, uh, in markets. Uh, you know, I think that, uh, I mean, my son, Tim and I put together, we, we, uh, we have this TNT trader it's a short-term trading system and we are all in. Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and the blockchain technology and all of this sort of thing. Uh, I mean, they are, we are printing money right now virtually. I mean, uh, it's because we have call options on top of the, the Bitcoin. And what you, you talked about the government shutting it down. Well, guess what the government did? And one reason the market has taken off when the SEC approved all the ETFs in Bitcoin, that was the bottom. That was a message mm-hmm. saying, "Hey, the government's actually approved this, and it, you, 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 uh, you, the returns have just been spectacular." And we actually think it it could hit a hundred thousand before oh, yeah. over a hundred thousand before it's over. We we will see these kind I'm of convinced. predictions. You have to be careful of because you never know when some kind of event is going to occur that causes it to collapse. How do do I uh, sign up for your TNT trader stock investor, Mark? Well, you you go to markskousen.com and TNT trader is there. And uh, it's a a rather expensive service, but we do have an introductory offer of $99 for the first quarter, but then it's $275 every quarter after that. So, Mark, if it were... It's chop change, chop change for... uh, for those of you who want to make money. Mark, <laughs> obviously you didn't hear that we're having this thing called inflation. You should be getting at least $500 a quarter for this because if it works, hey, people always say, well, if, it re- if the system really worked, if the guy knew what he was doing, particularly with gambling systems, he wouldn't be selling it to the public. He'd just be out there printing money. But there is- well, a- I'm doing both. I have it in my own portfolio as well. So- uh we're 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 doing both, but I'm, I'm signing up today. Yes, yes, sir. I'm signing <laughs> up, and I will have a link in the show notes to this interview that the AI will be gracious enough to write for you. Well, um, thank you. <laughs> and uh, because because one thing I've learned is the system may be good or it may be bad, but it's better than not having any system at all. Because the only way to make money over the long run is discipline. Because discipline will get you in there when you should be, and it'll get you out when you need to be out. Emotions, if you don't have a system, then you're only running on emotions. I I think also we have protective stops so that we move the trailing stop up as we're making money and we get stopped out because you never know when the market's going to turn against you, especially in the option area. And we we do out-of-the-money call options, which is... uh, uh, a high risk, but you know you can't lose more than a hundred percent. But you have yeah. uh, a upside potential that's unlimited. So that's our approach. All right, I love it. Hey, we'll have two links there: a uh, link to Mark's site and TNT Trader, as well as to uh, FreedomFest.com. 
I am definitely going to be there this time. Mark, appreciate your uh, taking time out from your pursuits here to touch base with us and bring us up to date. If you got a question for Mark, myself, the email address is kl at kerrylutz.com. And uh, make sure you go to the site, financialsurvivalnetwork.com, and uh, sign up for our free newsletter. Mark, always a pleasure. We'll see you in Vegas. All right. Take care. Thank you, Kerry. Thanks for listening to Kerry Lutz's Financial Survival Network, your solution to today's trying times. For the latest, go to financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever.